everybody thought when they first heard the record was, gee, I can do better than that, and why don't I give it a shot? The first thing you have to do is you have to start off with a strong kick drum. And then you have to have a bass line. And from there, you build on it. You build on it with uh, snare drums. You build on it with the hi-hat. You build on it with the rim shot, with the claps. And then we just needed something to say over it. So I ended up saying time to jack and just kind of slow pitch my voice down a little bit. and. Uh, History was made. <laughs> Turn to Jack. Tap, 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 turn to Jack. Tap, 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 turn to Jack. I can remember the first time I heard it played in a club was uh, was a club on Rush Street called the Mars Bar, and Farley was playing there. And I took it to him, and he looked at it, he put it on, and he listened to it in the headphones. About five seconds later, he slammed the fader over, and you hear just the thump, boom, 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 boom. And then all of a sudden you hear, time to jack. The crowd just went fucking wild. People just lost their minds. Tap, 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 time to jack. Tap, 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 time to By 1985, every kid in Chicago with a drum machine was making house. For a time, Chicago house just took over. You couldn't go to a club and just not hear our music, and it was a great moment. Now it was about to take flight outside Chicago. They didn't know how to play their instruments. They, most of them weren't even musicians. They came along with the music media, with the electronic revolution. They learned how to beat out simple rhythms on, on the drum machines that nobody knew about. And they learned how to use sequencers when sequencers were strange toys. Uh, they were innovators, pioneers. Uh, it was just a special time. Larry Sherman owned Chicago's only record pressing plant. As the first wave of house tracks emerged, he launched the tracks label. If the guy brought in a tape today, I tried to have a record out within within a week. That's kind of what set tracks apart, was the ability to get the materials into the marketplace. We didn't have to wait for somebody to say, well, I think this might be a good record, I might buy it. Uh, we came in and said, this is a great record and you need it. This is house. Do you like it? It's wonderful stuff. Early releases like Adonis's No Way Back defined the emerging house sound. But it was business skill that made tracks the dominant label. Vinyl at that time was running about 70 cents a pound or 30 cents a record, roughly. Uh, I couldn't afford it to produce large quantities because the cash flow was terrible. So I bought large quantities of new unsold records. Then he'd grind them up and he'd reprocess them again and make new records, which is why his records always had the pops and they weren't like very well pressed and they would warp and everything because it, was, it wasn't virgin vinyl. And I apologize to the public on this one. The reason that uh, some of the records were at best shoddy at some times was because I just ran the parts if they would still fit in the machine and didn't come out, I was running records. Made the best record you could make for a quarter. By now, club kids were firing the music's evolution. In late 85, a couple of music box fans spawned a new style of house by abusing a machine designed for karaoke. But well, basically, we started using a 303 just to try to make bass lines because when we first started making music, it, it sucked. So I made this rhythm, what you hear playing right now. And it's just playing straight, he said, but I can't figure out how to work this thing. He's still doing this weird, like, 
sound. You know, it's like I don't know how to program it. So he's he's like figure maybe he said maybe you could figure out how to program it because it didn't come with a book. And so I was like, instead of trying to program it, I just started turning knobs. I was like, Ugh. and he's like, well, what you doing? I'm like, I don't turn these knobs. He said, keep doing that. I'm like, I'm turning the knobs. And we just sitting there for like 30, 40 minutes. I'm just turning knobs. And like, yeah, I like that. I like that. There's been 5,000 Acid House records after that one. And nobody did it like Pierre. Pierre did it in a, in a musical way that followed the mood of the song. Everybody else just turned knobs, man. No, it's never been done like that. So if anybody would like, would be daring enough to play this, it'll be Ron Hardy. He ended up playing it four times that night. The first time he played it, the people didn't really know how to react to it. He played it again, people was looking like, hmm. I guess it's early, he playing some crazy stuff. The fourth time, they lost their mind. And that was, that was the birth of acid right there. Ron Hardy gave me D DJ Pierre's tape. Marshall Jefferson was the, uh, the ear for Larry Sherman. Larry Sherman had no clue what was going on with the music. You know, I said, Larry, you gotta put this out. You gotta put it out. He said, there's no words on it. I said, yeah, but you said that about can you feel it? Can You Feel It brought jazz sophistication to the Raw House beat. But despite a string of classics, bitterness was bubbling at Tracks Records. You get the contract, he tells you how much money he's gonna give you, and that's it. And meanwhile, this guy could be making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on your music. If all you had to do is say, this is a standard contract, and they oh, well, if it's a standard contract, where do I sign, you know? A lot of kids, you know, for a thousand dollars, Larry would give them a thousand dollars and say, but I own everything. If you don't have the money, you can't go get a lawyer to read the contract for you. The retainer fee alone with a lawyer is going to kill you. Larry's admonitions to his artists who are signing up without lawyers he would always, he would, uh, at least I heard him say this, and uh, he seemed to be, you know, uh, doing it, he was, I mean, he seemed to be proud of the fact that he was giving them this, like, warning in advance, you know, he says, oh, look, you say, I want you to know that this is a business. He says, and if I can screw you, he says, I will, you know what I mean? And he meant it, you know what I mean? And, uh, and not that he's in, uh, any more unusual than any other record company, in my opinion, but I always admired him because he was honest enough to tell them in advance that, you know, you might be, you know, in for a real experience here. The pioneers of House had sold their tracks to Sherman. But as record sales boomed, some felt hard done by. I mean, what would happen is they would go there with their first record because he was the only plant in town. They had reservations, but the thing of wanting to get their music out was just a little stronger, and so they're trying to do the best deal that they can do, but uh, it just wasn't good enough, <laughs> you know? Larry's deal is a deal. It's an opportunity. Guys get to put records out, but you may not make any money. That's just the deal. <laughs> the paperwork is right. The people got paid handsomely in the advan in, in the early stages uh, it's just a general consensus in house that they're of the opinion they sold more records than the business dictated <laughs>